Hey y'all, we're recording this um, that way that we can disseminate it and share it. We got one ask if y'all can record it. Obviously you can too, but this will hopefully be a nicer version of it. Um, I appreciate you asking. Obviously we can't stop you from recording things. So that's the way the cookie crumbles. Uh, all right, so maybe we should go ahead and get started. We still have people coming in steadily and I'll try to focus while the binging, the Zoom doorbell continues to ring in my ear. I feel confident that I can do it. Um, all right, so once again, thank y'all for joining us here today. My name is um, Marisa Zapata, and I am the director of the Homelessness Research and Action Collaborative. Um, I am joined today by my colleagues, Todd Ferry, and Greg Townley. And we are here to talk about our research that we did over about, about um, villages in the Portland region. Um, so we're gonna talk a little bit about um, what brought us to this work, how it happened, and what we were actually doing when we did this assessment, and then some of the takeaways and key findings. Um, this work is now part of uh, what we're doing today is part of PSU's research week. Every year we have a week that celebrates all the amazing research that people are doing, including students and staff and faculty. And uh, we encourage you to go to the website, check out the other amazing events that are happening for research week. And um, always, you know, take advantage of your friendly university and the access to knowledge and things that you might not think about. For instance, the vice president of research and graduate studies studies fish. Did y'all know that there are like fish living on campus in aquariums? Super interesting. All right, so um, without further ado, we wanted to start off by talking about um, where this kind of constellation around homelessness and alternative solutions uh, shelter actually come in. And then really then dig into what the alternative shelter model of the pod village is that we looked at. There is a lot of different types of camps, villages, informal shelter um, that we can talk about and think about. And you'll see articles coming out. There was one um, that was based in LA recently that is like the tiny pod is akin to a jail cell. And yes, their, their tiny paws and what was happening there were quite atrocious. Um, but what we're proposing and what we found is very different than that model. And other people are doing other models that they might also find um, really great work in. And so this is contextualized within one particular set of villages that we looked at, um, and we are dubbing them pod villages. Uh, so. The fundamental solution to homelessness is housing, and we will always sell that at every event that we have, even when we're talking about alternative shelter. Um, you know, we do not want people to think that tiny pond villages are the stopping point for ending and resolving homelessness. Um, in fact, that is just one part of a response. Rather than thinking about um, uh, about what it means to actually provide housing um, and then providing access to the kind of supports that people need. You'll hear about what's called housing first. And I was talking with a colleague recently and we're like, no, it's not housing only, but it's housing first, right? It's getting people in and letting them live in housing and then begin to access the wraparound services they might need to best um, to live their best lives. And so that's really what we're trying to do and be about at ATRAC. Um, of course, we also know that within the reality of what's happening, we have a lot of people who uh, do not have access to emergency shelter. Um, emergency shelter might not be a format that actually works well for them. Um, and we're really thinking about ways to produce and provide alternative shelter um, and what that can mean and look like. Uh, the alternative shelter today that we'll be talking about obviously is the tiny pod village, but there are things like motels, um, informal camps and so forth. Uh, when we think about other forms of emergency response to homelessness, that's when we're getting into things like meals, hygiene, waste management, and mobile services. And so that's kind of the constellation of activities that fall under responses to homelessness as opposed to the solution to homelessness. 
All right, I'm going to hand it over to Todd to share some exciting thoughts. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Zapata. Uh, <clears throat> as a little bit of an introduction to, to this subject, for those not acquainted, I'll share with you um, how I got involved in this work through my role at the Center for Public Interest Design. And it was following the state of emergency that was declared in Portland around housing and homelessness and a group called the Village Coalition formed. And I was invited to be a part of that group. And it was led by houseless folks, particularly many of whom came from Hazelnut Grove, a newly formed village, a self-governed village here in Portland that still exists. And uh, folks were advocating for villages as, all, as opposed to other shelter that were being called for at the time. So with students, I began to, to look at this issue and learn from uh, learn from the folks in the room and where exactly pods might fall on this spectrum between uh, permanent affordable housing and, and being unsheltered as one point. One uh, really unique aspect of, of villages in our region is that they take advantage of underutilized land, usually where housing couldn't be developed otherwise or is, is stalled. So for example, Hazelnut Grove uh, is located on a on a stretch of land that's owned by the Oregon Department of Transportation. The Kenton Women's Village um, is located, was the pilot project of it, was located on a, a site that was slated for development, uh, but was, uh, but while the funding was being procured, the site was remained open. And then Agape Village is a, is a village uh, that is at the base of Kelly Butte and isn't, uh, isn't a spot for, for development for housing or something else. So through this, working with a whole lot of collaborators, um, I got to be involved in the creation of the, the Kent Women's Village and the Clackamas County Veterans and the Clackamas County Veterans Village, both of which are managed villages, and then Agape Village more recently. To get a little bit more into what some of these look like or how they come together, I'll share a bit about Kent Women's Village we call 2.0. Following the pilot period of the pilot project of Kent Women's Village on this site in Kenton, uh, it, was, it was deemed worthy of continuing on and was looking for a more permanent site. And in order to, to maintain the social fabric and infrastructure that they'd built in the relationship with the neighborhood, they moved to, um, to this site here. And so while it's not, it's not ideal, it's owned by the Bureau of Environmental Services, things couldn't be built on it otherwise because there's sewer mains underneath it, uh, but it allows these to maintain these connections with the neighborhood. We wanted to learn from what was happening at the time from a design point of view from the first Kent Women's Village and how can we improve upon it. So working with this great team of people, um, we, we, uh, we invited contractors to come in and to start to contribute to this in the way that the first Kent Women's Village had really been, uh, the pods had been created through an initiative inviting architects into the conversation. And so that's this picture you see at the bottom of the first Kent Women's Village were different architecture firms prototyping pods to, to learn from what would work to hopefully iterate on it and advance it. And so now uh, these contractors agreed to uh, use three pod designs and that were deemed to kind of uh, be the most favorable to build them and to donate them to the Kent Women's Village. So to give you a sense of what they look like and, and th how this has evolved, they now all have electricity, heat, lighting, power. So this is by Scott Edwards Architects, it's the Catalyst Pod. This is a pop-up pod designed with students at Portland State University. Here's the interior. And then the Safe Pod, pod by SRG Architects. And so one amazing thing about working in this way is that it invites a lot of people into, uh, into being, into direct involvement around addressing homelessness in some way where they might not otherwise be able to. So there were a lot of uh, incredible teams that contributed. At Villages, they, off, they also have common facilities. And so uh, this is the design for the common facility at the New Kent Women's Village. So there's gathering space, kitchen, uh, dining, laundry, and bathrooms. And here's the common facility going in. It was made out of shipping containers in order to sit closer to the ground. And for a sense of what these cost, this village uh, is estimated to cost around $830,000. 
Uh, but through the process, it ended up being being about half that, or maybe around four hundred thousand dollars, and largely because there was so uh, much pro bono effort, uh, thanks in large part to the contractor teams who donated all those pods and work. These can happen fairly quickly. Um, it actually was uh, this whole process for the second um, Kent Women's Village was only about seven months. Most recently, the St. John's Village opened uh, just within the last year. So villages are becoming increasingly common. They're happening all over the country, as Dr. Zapata said, and, uh, and there's, there's reason to think that they're going to continue growing in Portland and otherwise. And so we wanted to really take a look at what we can learn from the villages that are there and how we can support best practices based on, based on what's happening in our region. So I'll hand it over to Dr. Townley. Great, thank you, Todd. Share my screen. As, as Todd noted, there's a lot of enthusiasm in Portland and other parts of the nation around the village model, but there's not been a lot of systematic research on how these villages work for residents, who they serve, and how they impact neighborhoods. And to help fill this gap, we conducted mixed methods research across six villages and their neighborhoods in the Portland metropolitan area. Uh, the villages that were included in this uh, particular study were the St. John's Village, Kenton Women's Village, Dignity Village, Hazelnut Grove, Agape Village, and Clackamas Veterans Village. And I think it's probably been noted, but if not, uh, the work was funded by the Meyer Memorial Trust. Collectively in this research, we conducted surveys and interviews with 42 villagers to ask questions about village governance structure, on-site services and pod design, and to understand the impact of the villages on their sense of community, safety, health behaviors, food security, transportation, and social support. We also interviewed nine village staff about the number of transitions to permanent housing, employment outcomes, and health service utilization, and seven designers and six village creators and builders about the siting process and development of each village. We also interviewed 16 neighbors of villages to understand their attitudes toward and experiences with villages, with a focus on those who shifted from opposing to supporting the village or the reverse. We also conducted a large community-wide survey with over 2,000 Portlanders asking about a variety of housing and service options, including villages. We found 436 of these neighbors uh, lived near one of the villages in our study. And in addition to all these people who were so critical in helping to provide their perspectives, I also note uh, we have a couple uh, research assistants, uh, Drs. Patricia Stewart and Lauren Everett, who were uh, really instrumental in helping to collect data that we'll be talking about today. So thank you for that. Sorry if I've missed others who may be in the, the list who came in after I start presenting. Uh, for, this, for my part of the presentation, I'll focus on the villagers' experiences and share just a few highlights from our surveys and interviews with them. And more information can be, can be found in our village research and how-to guide. So we, again, we conducted surveys and in-depth interviews with 42 villagers across the six villages included in the study. And this slide displays the demographic profile of the villagers included in, in our research. You can see from this demographic breakdown that the current villages primarily serve white community members and specifically white men. This disparity is reflected in our research with only 17% of the villagers we interviewed identifying as Black, Indigenous, or other people of color, despite the most recent point in time count from Multnomah County in 2019 reporting that 40% of those who were unsheltered were people of color. This could reflect some self-selection. We offered to include everyone in our surveys, and not everyone chose to participate. But these numbers are in line with what village managers and staff told us about the racial makeup of the villages and that across villages, villagers, villagers are primarily white. Why is this? Is the village model viable or appropriate for communities of color? This is something we hope to learn about in the work. And we found that villagers who were black, indigenous, and other people of color reported lower levels of belonging and acceptance within their villages compared to white villagers. So clearly current villages need to institute more mechanisms to support people of color. And we also know that villages that are designed by and for people of color are on the horizon, such as Laquita Lanford's Afro Village, which is profiled in our guide. One important part of the work was talking with villagers about their pods, their villages and neighborhoods, what they liked and what they didn't like. We did this in a variety of ways, 
including survey questions adapted from established housing and neighborhood measures used in the supported housing research. Questions are asked on a scale of one to five or strongly disagree to strongly agree. And here you can see the average scores for these different uh, scales that were included in the work. I'll just give some descriptions of what they entail. Pod quality includes questions such as, I have enough space in my pod, and my pod is usually at comfortable temperature. Village social climate includes questions about social cohesion and sense of community at the village, with questions such as, I feel like part of the village, like I belong here, and I feel safe in the village. The village resident scale asks questions about relationships with other villagers, such as, I can count on a villager for help when I need it and other villagers complain about me or my pot. Neighborhood quality includes items such as there are nice parks in my neighborhood and I have good sidewalks in my neighborhood. And some areas that brought the score down relative to the, some of the other scales were in terms of noise, traffic, and air quality near the village. And finally, neighborhood social climate is similar to village social climate, but with more questions about social interactions and sense of, of belonging in the broader community. Uh, you see it's a bit lower than village social climate, which makes sense given the greater proximity and ability to build a sense of community inside the village compared to outside the village. Villagers were highly satisfied with their pods with 86% of participants reporting that they were satisfied or very satisfied, followed by neighborhoods with 79% of participants reporting that they were satisfied or very satisfied with their neighborhoods as a place to live. And then villages with 69% saying they were satisfied or very satisfied with the village as a place to live. 85% of participants reported that their current living situation is better than their previous situation. And when asked how long they want to live in the village on a scale of one to five, with one being no longer than necessary and five being as long as possible, the average score was right in the middle at 3.32. When we look at the extremes, the eight participants who said no longer than necessary talked about more negative experience, such as conflict with villagers or frustration with village rules. Others discussed wanting their own home or apartment or wanting to transition out to a, so a spot in the village will be available for someone else to take. And the 14 partic participants who said they went, wanted to live in the village as long as possible, like the social support of other villagers, they felt comfortable, they felt content in the village and they expressed wanting to work on themselves and build a routine before transitioning to permanent housing options. We were also interested in how villages helped people access services and meet their basic needs. In terms of transportation access and walkability, 93% of the sample indicated living close to a, buck, a bus, max, or streetcar line, which is great for access to other parts of the city, getting to services, appointments, and work. 69% of participants said they could walk to stores and services from their homes. In some cases though, this was a long walk or involved walking uphill. So certainly a challenge for people with mobility issues. And there were, there were six villagers we spoke with who relied on mobility aids such as walkers, canes, or wheelchairs. We also were interested in how villages may help people meet their basic needs for food. We used the six item food security survey from the USDA which asked questions about food access in the last 30 days, such as how often could you not afford to eat balanced meals in the last 30 days? And in the last 30 days, were you ever hungry but didn't eat because there was, wasn't enough money for food? Based on these questions, we found that just under half of the villagers we surveyed were food insecurity. And 33% of participants ranked as very low food security, suggesting that while villages are helping some individuals meet their basic needs for food, there's still a need to ensure that everyone has access to food. And then finally, we also asked about other aspects of health and well-being. We asked people how satisfied they are with their lives on a scale of one, one which is terrible, to seven, delighted. And the average score was 4.71, which indicates mixed to mostly satisfied with their lives. Roughly half of participants had seen a healthcare provider in the past month. This could be for primary care visits or behavioral health appointments. Three quarters of the sample had coverage from the Oregon Health Plan, OHP which is encouraging in terms of being able to get needed health, health services covered by their insurance. After concluding surveys, we did follow-up open-ended interviews with villagers to learn more about their experiences. Interviews were coded and we pulled out common themes from across the villages. I'll share just a couple here. 
The first being around housing features. Villagers who lived in villages that didn't have electricity and plumbing hoped to see those utilities added. There were also some issues with the number of bathrooms and distance between bathrooms and pods, illustrated by a couple quotes here. There's only three bathrooms and sometimes there's 20 women in here. It's difficult to hold it if you have to go that bad. Another said, that is inside accessibility to bathrooms because there's 60 yards, that's too far. Some of these guys have bladder issues, which illustrates the importance of thinking about age demographics and mobility needs in villages and how they may differ from the general population and should be accounted for in the site design. Some villagers do not, some villages do not have common areas and villagers were interested in making those areas bigger. At other villages that did, uh, did, did not have common areas, villagers were interested in a place to socialize, something to do outside the small pod. One person said, I think the pods are a good size. I mean, all you really need is a bed and a place to keep your stuff. I think they had a bigger common areas because you don't always just wanna be in your room. It's like you wanna get out and do something. So if they had a common area where they had like maybe games or TV, something like that, just where you can interact with others. We also ask questions about governance, that is how a village is run. Some are managed by a nonprofit, church, or other organization, and others are run by the villagers. Across the villages, 69% of villagers said they should share in decision-making at the village, that is decisions should be made in collaboration with staff, social service providers, and possibly neighbors. An additional 26% said that only villagers should determine what happens in the village. Overall, though, the feeling of having a voice in the village had major impacts on villager satisfaction and sense of community, which the following quotes reflect. Four out of the six villages were managed by the city, county, or other nonprofit organizations. These managed villages, such as Kenton Women's Village and Clackamas Veterans Village, had varying opportunities for residents to voice concerns. But at the end of the day, most decisions were made by management. One person said, they'll ask you your opinion. They'll take that into consideration but then they'll do whatever they feel is best. Another said, we do have our say and we're allowed to speak for ourselves and what we think. But when it comes down to it, it's mainly up to the staff and the facilities. At self-governed villages included in the study, such as Hazelnut Grove and Dignity Village, the vast majority of residents said that residents meet and discuss decisions and either reach consensus or vote. And villagers noted there was a greater sense of community and a sense that villagers looked out for each other. One person said, knowing that if there's an issue, there's a whole community of people that will help solve it. it. Helps me feel safe. And finally, the sense that if anything gets really crazy, the community is pretty good at breaking it up and trying to de-escalate. The communal watching, I guess. As soon as there's an external threat, it's immediate. We're a super organism and we've got each other's backs. Again, just a sampling of the many findings that are included in the how-to guide and research. And I will now turn things over to Dr. Zapata, who will talk about the neighborhood aspect of this work. Yes, I'm muted and my video is off. I was trying to give witty repertoire while I was uh, chatting. Why won't it let me do myself? Hmm. All right, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and turn my video on that way. Oh, no, there we go. Okay. All right, you think it's year two, I would be amazing at knowing exactly how to triage everything with Zoom, but apparently not. All right, so one of the things that we thought was really important was to understand what housed neighbors um, and other neighbors, though we focus mostly on housed neighbors, thought about villages. And part of that is, of course, there's been a lot of claims and discussion about um, angry neighbors, supportive neighbors, um, a lot of like academic theories that go along with the idea of, you know, working with people and having them integrated into your community can bring out good outcomes, so forth and so forth. Um, so we, we dug into neighbors to the villages and we did a survey 
um, we did a survey of citywide of Portlanders. About 2,000 people responded to the survey. What I'm going to talk about here focuses on neighbors adjacent to villages. So we did that by neighborhood. And our next step is to be doing some comparative work to see what people thought that was different. We have done some of that. Um, and it looks like there are interesting findings, but we um, now I'll need to do some like demographic overlays with that. So it's pretty interesting what we found. Um, some things that were consistent with what we would expect and sometimes not. We also interviewed people who were living adjacent to villages as well. And I'll talk about those high points as well. Um, I think the big thing that for us is a great takeaway is that people know what the solution to homelessness is. Um, one of the things that we are very interested in following up on is that um, while when people were thinking about homelessness more abstracted, they knew what the solution was um, and they knew what was a driver for homelessness. When they we asked them about the people who lived in their neighborhoods who they perceived to be unhoused, um, it actually, they started to focus more on options related to shelter and not to housing. Um, one of the reassuring concept things that came out was that concerns about villages um, do diminish over time. Not all of them, but several of the kind of big ones that pop up um, did diminish over time. So um, people who did not live near a village um, really did look at affordable housing as a top three driver for homelessness, a lack of it. Um, they were also, though, uh, more likely than people who were housed to see substance use as a main driver of homelessness as well. And so, you know, we know that people are understanding um, the, the main nugget being home uh, housing and the need for certain kinds of services, but they, they aren't quite making the connection to understand that people experiencing homelessness may or may not have a substance use disorder and that may or may not be what is contributing to their homelessness. Um, ah, next slide. Um, so yeah, so we really dug into the solutions to homelessness. 39% um, who lived near a village said supportive services. 26% said um, near, near a village said housing. Um, and so combined together, that gets us over 51% of people understanding that it's services and housing. Like I said earlier, we know that housing first is the way to do this, but that people do in fact often need some kind of supportive services. We asked neighbors how they engage with the village. Um, and I think one of the standout things is that you know, people might donate or attend meetings or wave or walk by. Most neighbors aren't really doing anything. And so, um, you know, I think that speaks to the both that there is an opportunity to engage and support your village, uh, but also that having a village may not actually impact your life at all one way or the other. Um, I know I live in St. John's and I walk by the village on a regular basis. It looks like a regular lot um, where there's actually a fence up. I can't even see what's going on inside. And so um, those are the type of things that, that are reassuring in terms of locating a village, even when there has been high controversy, such as in St. John's. Um, what was really interesting was how people learned about the village. And I think one of the takeaways for us is that there is a lot of emphasis and catering to the angry neighbor. Right, the people who are like up in arms and ready to be like, no, this is terrible. We have all these demands that must be met. Um, but 20% of people learned about the village after the fact, including several of them hearing about the village for the first time through our survey. <laughs> and so there's a number of people who just aren't really engaging that dramatically around villages. Um, <clears throat> We also, you know, see that if you want to get the word out, people are hearing about neighborhood associations, general social media, and news stories. Um, and one of the complaints that we've heard a lot, and we saw in the survey and interviews, was was finding out the information, but not through an official channel to start with, right? And so the initial rollout being like, "Oh my God, we heard about something," not the city is bringing us something and informing us about this process. Um, the top concerns before people moved in to the village uh, was an increase in trash and behavior, crime increase, more people experiencing homelessness, moving in there. 25% of people had no concerns 
and a number of people were most concerned about the people living who were experiencing homelessness who would be moving into the village. So again, the the oh my god, there's going to be trash. Oh my god, there might be terrible people moving in. Um, reactions that get the headlines are really also missing the number of people who were like meh cool, don't care, or I am actually most concerned about the welfare of people who are living in the villages. Um, and then, um, well, I forgot to include property values being another one. So uh, increased waste was 42%. Um, and so it had gone down. It's still higher than we would like to see. And fortunately, there's a really great solution for that, right? We can pick up increased waste and, and deal with that. Um, but you'll see that behaviors dropped down to 29%. And so once people moved in and neighbors were able to see um, that whatever their, their really terrible stereotypes are about people experiencing homelessness, um, they were able to see that that's not actually the case. And that really um, that, you know, that those behaviors did not warrant the same level of concern that they had. Again, we had 31%, so even more people had gone up on uh, no concerns, and 29% were more concerned about well-being and safety of villagers. So again, thinking about like what's really what we really should be focusing on is I think building um, the relationships and networking and advocacy around people who either don't have concerns or who are expressing concern for people. The property values um, concern that gets raised, we did a, um, and Julia Freiburg from our College of Business did a really great analysis of property values. Looking at the four villages that were in residential communities, she found that, um, that three of them, there was no possible associated impact with the village and increases or decreases to property values. There is one, there was an association in St. John's, but there's a number of confounding variables that could make that more complicated. And I can talk about that more um, in the chat. I mean, after in, in um, um, during the Q&A. So um, um, housing options for people. We asked like a range of housing and shelter options together in part because we know that a lot of people don't have like a really firm line between housing and shelter in their minds. Um, and what we thought was especially interesting was this idea of the tiny village managed by government, very close margins um, of, you know, 48%. Um, and these verses are people who lived in near villages and people who did not. Um, tiny villages managed by residents, right? Again, this is something where there's often an intense, oh my God, no, we could never trust manage, uh, residents to manage their own village. At the end of the day, there wasn't like a lot of, of strong negative. I mean, people were supportive of that. These were the top ones. And then um, sanctioned encampments even did not, um, really did receive some support in this. Uh, okay, so when we talked to people in the neighborhoods um, through interviews, we were interested in talking to people who had started off as advocates for this model, people who had been like up in arms over it, and people who had always been kind of like, eh, either way. Um, they really felt the communication was essential to, to shifting ideas and, and people's perspectives on wanting to be supportive of villages. Um, community engagement was something that was really important to them. Um, I think that we all really want to caveat, and um, I, I've got a quote later that gets at this, um, that, that community engagement is great, except that people who are housed should not have the right to deny or have a say over where people experiencing homelessness live. And if we were talking about conventional housing, um, we could end up even in a situation where that might be illegal, right? And so we really want to be clear that um, that we are not empowering community members to think that it is acceptable that they can somehow determine who their neighbors are. Um, the changing attitudes did happen through the most direct interactions. And so getting to meet people who were going to be village residents or village residents elsewhere, getting to talk to people from other neighborhoods who had welcomed a village in to understand what it was really like, all very important. Um, so this quote, I think, really, um, really exemplifies a lot what was going on, like that, you know, it was 
there was a lot of anticipation, but then really when they opened it, people were great and fine and it was no big deal. All right, so I'm gonna wrap up there and hand it back over to Todd. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Share my screen. Oh, sorry, y'all. All right. You see me advancing slides? I sometimes have an issue here. Yeah. Let me try one more time. We can see him, Todd. Okay. Uh, Thanks so much. So the result of, of talking with uh, all of these interviews and all of these surveys, we tried to put it into a guide that could be helpful um, for those who are, are doing village, village work because there's a lot of them that are upcoming. Now, there are a lot of different minimal dwelling sizes that have been and can be used for villages. Um, as an example of the way that we're focusing this guide, it's based on what we can learn based on uh, information learned from these specific six villages, the results of our study. And so in this case, it's using uh, a sleeping pod. And those obviously have pros and cons in different ways with, with other type of dwellings. But, uh, but I'll give you examples of the type of uh, outcomes or information that's in the guide. So sleeping pods can be up to 200 uh, square feet in our region and 240 uh, are, is now allowed in Portland. They're often, uh, their dimensions often have to do with mobility. And so usually about eight and a half feet wide by 12 feet uh, long and 10 and a half feet have to do with what can be lifted with standard equipment like a forklift and moved on a flatbed truck without extra permitting. So that, those tend to be the sizes um, when mobility is an issue based on, the, based on the site and how they're fabricated. Sleeping pods that um, were that broke the box that weren't as boxy were strongly preferred by villagers. Often, uh, folks were citing um, negative experience with institutionalization, and so uh, we recommend is thinking about how formally pods can help to help to feel larger and help to break up break up that box. There wasn't a strong preference between. Uh, whether pods, as you see on the left, were uh, very were all the same, or whether they were very distinct, as you see on the right. What did matter a lot was the ability for villagers to be able to have influence over the interior and change it around. So what you're seeing on the bottom here are three different configurations that are used uh, within the pop-up pod at the St. John's Village. The question of how many villagers should be at a village comes up quite often, and uh, so. The overwhelmingly, we heard the right number was 20 to 30. For some, it had to do with what can fit on common sites based on the, the spacing like you see here. For others, it had to do with cohesive communities. Um, in other cases, it was uh, talking to some village designers. It had to do with just the efficiencies that come with a common facility serving that number of people. We also heard from a couple of people at Hazelnut Grove who talked about how uh, it actually aligns really well with work shifts for self-governed villages so that, that people are uh, be able to work in pairs doing, the, doing work that's not too overwhelming, but still contributing regularly. So 20 to 30 is the number that came up over and over from those with lived experience working, building, and uh, living in villages. As Dr. Townley mentioned, there's still uh, issues with proximity to facilities. So certainly if you have to wake up several times in the night to use the bathroom, um, although it's really efficient to lump them all together in a common facility with future designs, we should really think about how to reduce the proximity from pods uh, to bathrooms and other amenities. There was a, there, uh, the site layout and the relationship between pods has seemed to have impact on, on certain experiences and satisfaction. So villagers preferred more organic layouts than gridded layouts. And on the more organic layouts cited that they felt like they had more privacy from their neighbor uh, and happier with their pod, whether they were actually closer uh, to their neighbor or not from the gridded villages. Often villages are on sites that maybe uh, are more like parking lots and there's a assumption that they can't be green but um, heat is a big problem on at some of the villages and there's there's a a lot of appreciation for for trees and green space 
And so I think we can think creatively how those things can be incorporated, even if part of the premise of the village is that it needs to be mobile, like the pods. There are a lot of uh, visitors to village to villages, and so uh, we need to think about how we maintain privacy for villagers, um, while we also acknowledge that there will be all sorts of uh, all sorts of visitors. So how we can think about that more uh, more clearly. Management versus self govern governance, as uh, Dr. Townley mentioned, that there was a huge impact on satisfaction when villagers had agency and voice. And so we need to make sure that, uh, that that's embedded into all conversations. When full self-governance isn't possible, uh, we found examples at one of the managed villages, for example, where a community council of elected villagers could make decisions uh, that, had, that had significant impact over both the social fabric and the physical fabric of the village. Some things that are uh, that were that we found through the conversations that are, are potential opportunities are maybe aligning villages um, with uh, emergency responses. So right now, villages are serving serving people, and it's a typology that could be very useful in the event of an emergency in Portland that might look something like earthquake or wildfires. And this is actually already happening in the self-governed villages, the Dignity Village and Hazelnut Grove. So in extreme weather, for example, they take on extra people. Um, so it's something that could be pursued as a, for future villages. Designing to support family health. Uh, villages in the way that, uh, in the versions that we studied here in Portland uh, might not be right for families, but 20% uh, of those that we surveyed had children under the age of 18. So as their number of villages grow, could we, could we create one or think about creating some that can support people with families for child visitation and for family health? Uh, the desire for on-site microenterprise came up a lot with the villages, with villagers. So could we start to think about how that gets incorporated from the uh, very first um, uh, conceptions of villages? And then there's been a lot of conversation around uh, maybe designing villages around asset-based or identity-based um, factors. So often villages are designed around a perceived deficit of, of poverty or homelessness, but these are uh, human beings with incredible capacity, uh, with a lot of interests. And so um, villagers expressed a desire to maybe design around shared common interests and the, the ones that were most uh, favored were around gardening and farming. And then second to that was art and music. Often villages are pitted against affordable housing and we can, uh, but we can also imagine how villages could be step one toward permanent housing. So what you're seeing on the left is the Kent Women's Village in its pilot period. And eventually it, it received full utilities um, and then later on, it was uh, that same site that you're seeing on the right is this beautiful project by Holst Architecture, uh, which is a housing project. And while these two things operated independently, you could imagine in future projects how uh, a temporary village could, uh, the infrastructure for it could help support, incentivize permanent housing and really kind of be linked to into a system that's, that moves toward permanent housing. The Afro Village uh, is a really promising model that's, that's happening here in Portland, led by Laquita Lanford. And so the Afro Village uh, model, the Afro Village home proposal really recognizes that often the most expensive part of a village is a common facility. And so it imagines that maybe the common facility begins with a house and that the, it's got bathrooms, laundry, kitchens, gathering spaces, and maybe bedrooms that are occupied over time through uh, community processes, maybe pods or other units are added to that. And then after a, a, a fixed period of time, the ownership of, of this collective land and ho housing would go to a Black collaborative ownership. Finally, uh, as one of the recommendations we just really want to emphasize is that for all future villages that are happening, we really want to emphasize that villagers need to be part of the design team from the beginning. There are still a lot of unknowns. Our study focused on six villages in Portland, uh, but villagers are, villagers are really the experts in this and should be leading the conversation. Thank you so much.
All right, I'm here. Um, okay, so I'm gonna get us through the Q and A. I know that Todd and I can for sure stay after five a little bit to get into more questions. We've got a lot of really great ones. And uh, I just warn you, my son might have to join us, which is gonna be fun chaos if that happens. Uh, so we have a couple of methods questions. I'm just gonna answer those uh, really quickly. One of them was whether uh, many people who were, had formerly lived in villages were interviewed. Yes, they were. Uh, the other question was about neighborhood survey respondents. Um, we sent out everything electronically. Um, so we used Facebook, Twitter, um, uh, a number of neighborhood listservs. So the city sent it out via their listservs. Well, we were trying to really get to as many people as possible because so much of the, the pushback against villages is driven by people who are housed in middle class and affluent, we were really trying to focus on places where we would get that um, population sampled in, and that definitely happened. Uh, we were not able to do a survey pre and post, although one of the reasons why we did it citywide is that it allows us to potentially do post survey follow up as more villages and different village models go in. Uh, so we were asking for retrospective ideas. All right, so um, uh, Todd, uh, Greg, I don't know who wants to answer this, but are all villages housing first or are there barriers or boundaries surrounding who can live in a pod? You want to take that one, Greg? Well, I, I guess I can and start and say uh, that each village is different with varying degrees. Uh, they're, they're largely low barrier. Um, and it, with each each program, each village has its own mechanisms for uh, for entry. So it, it really, really varies. Yeah, I think that covers it. I don't have anything else to add. All right, next up on our list. Uh, I think this is a really fascinating question. This is for Todd. In pod designs and village layout, were there any attempt to avoid straight lines and boxiness? Curve lines dominate um, the trauma-informed design of the new Portland Homeless Family Solutions building. Yeah, good question. Um, the What we found is that what you're suggesting is that pods that aren't as boxy, that, that that break, uh, that they have to break up the box, that pop out, or more formally distinct, and that are more organic. The village, the overall village, were much more uh, well received and satisfied. And you're right; it absolutely uh, aligns with trauma-informed design. Those that tend to be more gridded um, are the result of efficiencies around getting electricity there, site constraints, or uh, the need to allow emergency vehicle access. But I think that hopefully this can help to really advance the conversation that these things that we're finding do uh, do align with things like trauma-informed design. So thanks for that question. All right. I'm curious to know what other companies besides Pallet make good sleeping pod type structures that are already built? Prefab structures that wouldn't require much craftsmanship, for instance. I and mean, let's be real, that's clearly for Todd. That is not for yeah. Melissa or Greg. <laughs> it, it's a good question. There are so many uh, companies that are that are doing minimal dwelling units in different kinds. And they're obviously the tiny houses on wheels. Uh, pallet, the pallet shelter uh, is obviously it, its own thing. Um, we, uh, we looked at, in our study, uh, we didn't find pods that were mass produced. The, in the one case that we did, Mods PDX made uh, all 19 pods at the St. John's Village. Um, there were, the first 15 pods at the Clackamas County Veterans Village was based on a design from SRG Architects, but that, uh, that's not a process that could be replicated because it was using PSU architecture students who made a design build at the Pickathon Music Festivals. It, there was a real really interesting story behind it, uh, but it's not exactly a product that's that's replicable. And so um, th this is a long way of saying that there's a lot out there. Uh, we really are sticking to what we kind of know within the study um, and that the, the one 
uh, group that did kind of do it as a product was Mods PDX using the, the pop up pod design that was designed by PSU students. Thank you, Todd. And just as a note, um, if you're sending me direct message texts at this point, um, I or questions, I'm not keeping up with a lot of them. I'm trying to, but it's really best to send them to Jason or to Stephanie. Um, all right, so Greg, what support services felt most important to Villager? There's a variety. I think probably primarily, I would say the peer support available by virtue of being uh, at the villages with other people with lived experience, just having the ability to talk with others who are going through similar experiences, learning from them, um, it relates to governance, relates to having councils of individuals who meet regularly to discuss village rules, regulations. Uh, so peer support, big one. Also, people appreciated uh, more formal supports they were connected to around mental health and physical health. Uh, through the village, it was a challenging time. We were doing these interviews exclusively during the pandemic. And so people did talk about missing opportunities for uh, different you know, student groups coming in, different service providers coming in to do workshops with them around mediation and de-escalation and different skills trainings. Uh, they really saw that as somewhat of a, a void during the pandemic. They, again, filtered in through their own peer support networks, but uh, having some of that, missing the, the experience of having other people coming into the village to do that training um, uh, was, was certainly noted. Um, those are the ones that come first and foremost to mind. People talk about job training, people talk about pet care. Um, yeah, those are some of the big ones. Oh, you're muted. Thank you, Greg. Um, okay, so there's a couple of questions about neighborhoods. And so I'm gonna ask, I'm gonna answer some of those. So. Um, the question was, was there an effort to engage neighborhoods prior to the village being um, brought in? Uh, this depended on the neighborhood and on the village. Um, and so Kenton Women's Village and St. John's um, Village were certainly involved in a lot of neighborhood process and discussion. Um, it, they were there was neighborhood a discussion for Agape and um, the Beds Veterans Village and Clackamas, but they were industrial areas or not terribly close to residential areas, so less direct engagement. Um, and uh, yeah, and, and the, the attempt was to gain support and to raise awareness. Um, okay, this is a question I'm quite excited about for many reasons. In a recent poll, 70% of metro area residents said they would vote yes on people for Portland's modification to the bond passed in 2020. For those of you who don't know what the bond was, it's actually a revenue measure, not a bond. I get yelled at every time when I use the word bond. Um, the raise that, that many of you probably voted on to um, to raise money for supportive services that would go in parallel with the bonds that have been passed for affordable housing. Um, People for Portland is an organization that is trying to lobby um, uh, to, <clears throat> to basically amend what the expectation was for that measure. And so they're trying to say instead of supportive services being the primary use of those funds that instead um, the primary use would be for shelter um, activities. Remember, housing is the only solution to homelessness. Shelter is not a solution to homelessness. Um, so, you know, so the, the effect that um, there's a lot of polls that have gone out with this and uh, a lot of questions about it. Um, I'm gonna just be very clear that, that um, at least the polls that I have seen that are associated with people for Portland are not what I would consider valid social science. And so I don't really take any of their, the polls that they have done that I've seen, they may have a different one out. I do not treat their polls as credible. And so it doesn't actually tell me anything when someone quotes or when people for Portland is saying, hey, according to our poll, people said yes to X thing. Um, so I think that you could very easily, um, really like get into like a, to, I would just encourage people to read critically anything that is social science-y. Now that said, I mean, that's light social science. Um, that said, you know, I think the next point this person is making in social media is rife with people who are irate about people who are unhoused, um, conducting certain behaviors and how do we feel this model can help stem the reactionary tide. Um, I think the, the 
next point of how fast can this model be scaled up is so important because the, the reality is what is stopping villages as we understand it from being cited faster and certainly what we saw in the kitten women's village process and the saint john's process is that um it is a choice by local government to allow people who are opposed to villages to carry that forward right there is nothing that would stop at this point the the installation of villages faster and that also applies to housing right and so part of what has supposedly been this great um, impetus for villages is that they would be expedient they are not happening quickly and so that is a choice that is being made just as it is a choice that we are not in fact trying to make housing faster and happen um okay so what makes a site suitable for a village or can they be anywhere? I'll answer that one. Um, they can theoretically be anywhere. And uh, there were some folks we talked to uh, who said that, you know, village can happen absolutely in a, in a motel. And um, uh, of course we studied six villages. And so within the typology we studied, the things that seemed to be really important were access to transportation, uh, access to food. Um, and then in terms of other things were that sites that were really parking lot based um, were a lot less muddy, were better for accessibility, but that uh, in extreme heat like we had last summer uh, could be really brutal. And so we're kind of balancing those things. In terms of what I think when folks are looking for sites for villages that aren't coming with huge amounts of money, um, then it's usually gonna be a site where that could be ideal where other things can't be built. People experiencing homelessness and villagers are uh, genius at, at kind of finding these things out. And so I think this, this goes to just having people with lived experience uh, living in villages on the, on the design team to help determine those things. But that's, that would be a starting point. So I actually, I'm going to um, ask these two questions. I'm not sure that we can answer these at this point because um, I'm certainly not in the weeds with some of this stuff. Uh, how, what is the best way for people to get into these villages? How are residents chosen? Todd or Greg, can you answer this? I can start and then Todd, I think you have more information, but it again varies by village. Some have a more formal process where there's an application. I know with like Kenton Women's Village, people talk about a case manager referral to Catholic charities who would then have an application that the uh, potential villager would um, fill out and then be um, admitted into the village through that channel. Through some of the self-governed villages like um, Hazelnut Grove, they have a process where there's a council meeting that people attend. They get introduced to the group. There's a process of villagers vetting this individual and kind of voting on their um, residents in the village. Uh, so again, it varies. And, and Todd, you will be able to fill in some more information from your experience too. I think that's it. It varies a lot. One interesting model that uh, is a dignity village, which of course is is the oldest village uh, in the study and in, uh, and around, is that they, when people are interested in coming they, and are on the wait list, they attend the General Assembly, they kind of become part, part of the community and are expected to kind of show up regularly for events or for volunteer um, opportunities. And that's just a way to, to keep them involved, to get to know them, make sure they're a good fit. And so when they're ready to onboard, uh, it doesn't disrupt the community and they're already part of it. All right. Um, so we've got a question about if there was an intent to look at the whole spectrum of housing solutions and repurposing existing spaces. Um, I that's not for us, not for this project, right? There's lots of people who are looking at lots of really cool things like abandoned malls. Um, so yeah, um, but then it goes on to ask the can build upon the housing readiness. Um, of those experiencing homelessness. We actually don't subscribe to a housing readiness philosophy at ATRAC. We think that everyone is ready for housing. They simply haven't been offered the housing um, or offered housing that would feel right to them. And so uh, I would treat those two concepts differently. Uh, we got a question about that there are um, other prior models of practices for village build builders. Yep, as we said at the beginning, there are a lot of different concepts of what constitutes a village and we've been working from one definition. Um, 
what is the goal and an effect of exerting a concept of village model that is strictly distinguished from housing? Um, I think that the the motivation behind that is to maintain that um, we actually owe people the opportunity to live in housing that includes a bathroom and a kitchen. And um, if we settle for uh, villages, village pods as housing, then we are denying some basic um, fundamental um, activities and resources to our community members. Um, it also helps just reinforce that that division is very solid in all statutory language and funding streams. And so making clear what shows up where. Um, Todd or Greg, do you want to add anything to that? Okay, uh, what would you identify as some baseline dignity standards that all villages should adhere to? Um, and I'm going to say from my perspective as the person who is looking at neighbors and community engagement, not allowing neighbors how, who are housed to have any say whatsoever about the siting of um, villages, the siting of camps, or the siting of affordable housing. Their voices and perspectives are not relevant to that conversation, and I see it as a deep denial of the dignity for people who are living in um, these circumstances. Greg and Todd. And do you mind repeating that question? I mean, I would, but people are deleting my question list. Oh, there it is. Would you identify, what would you identify as some basic baseline dignity standards that all villages should adhere to? Got it. So uh, we there are so, there are so many ways that people use the term village and definitions around there. So we took a shot based on uh, what we heard directly from the folks uh, in the interviews who are living at, working in, or, or building villages, and that includes the physical pieces, which is uh, individual, you know, sleeping units with shared common facilities. Um, sent a agreed com a community agreements and a, and a sense of community, shared community goals. And then finally, agency over both social and physical aspects of the villages. And so often, I think that what we're seeing is the first piece, just the physical, uh, you know, individual sleeping units and common facility, and that they're leaving out the, the community, the things that really make a community great, community agreements, and the agency. And so uh, villages need to have that. Greg, did you want to add anything? You guys got it. All right. So lastly, why was R2D2 not a part of the study? Because they have more of a rest stop model. Um, there were a couple motivations for, um, yeah. Okay, I'm sorry, I got confused a second. Yes, because they were a different model is the short answer. So the person who asked that question already had the brilliant answer. All right, that concludes our question and answer. Uh, feel free to follow up with us. I know we put the link to the, uh, uh to the report on the website uh, on the chat let us know if you have other friends you'd like to invite us to present with we really want to get um we really want to get um the word out there about this work particularly as there are so many ideas that we think um could go into action that are deeply concerning and and do not i think continue to lift up the spirit of the village model uh Okay, so that's it. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you all. Hey, Chuck, let's hang out.